Um, so another official welcome. Uh, this evening, we will be talking about uh, working with difficult emotions. Um, this, this was a topic that was a runner up for a couple of webinars. And then last month, that's what you chose um, uh, to hear about. And so in the past few weeks, I was kind of making a list in my, um, you know, in my free time as I was thinking about it, about what I would want to include. And then I realized that this should really be a series of webinars, not just one webinar, because there's really so much. So in the end, I decided to narrow down the topic to uh, first um, sort of understanding what our emotions are and what the point of their existence is and then working with them. But what I decided to do is to focus on more long-term techniques. So not like first aid stuff, but more things that, that will be beneficial over time. And we can talk, I also, in the list of topics in the poll that you can, you can vote in now, I decided to include uh, breathing exercises and grounding, which are very good ways of working with intense emotions when they show up. But I decided to leave them out of this webinar because in my mind, when I talk about change, I usually like to focus on, on sort of sustainable and long-term change. Also, I hope you don't hear the noise that's coming through my windows. Uh, for whatever reason, I usually, I live in a very silent street. And for whatever reason, whenever I have webinars or lectures of some sorts, cars seem to like to make noise. So let's just get started. So these are specifically the topics that we'll be talking about. Um, of course, as always, we'll be defining what emotions are because we have to know what we're talking about. Uh, we will talk a little bit about how to understand them and why we avoid them. And then we will connect avoidance to skin picking. Uh, this will be a very brief overview, especially for those of you who attend the webinars every month. Um, I, I believe the connection is, is, is kind of familiar to you already. Um, then we'll talk about sort of these constructive approaches to emotions, but with the focus on something that's done in the long run. So something that will help you create sustainable change. And then as always, we'll have a Q&A. And if you have any questions, you can, um, uh, you can sort of just ask them right away. And then I will get to them when, when I finish my part. I will try to be quick and efficient. And also keep in mind that I will mention all kinds of practices here, and I will send you either um, PDFs with instructions or audio guidance uh, after the webinar when they, in a, in a day or two, when they send you the, the recordings. I will also include all the resources that you need so that you can get started on your own. So let's start. So I included this slide. Um, partially because I like to add a little bit of history in these things, and partially because I think it's quite important. Um, we think of emotions as something that's really like a fundamental thing about our experience, like thoughts, emotions, it's, it's like the basics. Whatever psychological theory you find, it will address these things. However, emotions are not that old of a concept at all. In fact, they're about 200 years old, but not more than that. Before this, so it's only in the mid 19th century that we started talking about emotions in psychology in a coherent way. Before that, you had a lot of terms for these experiences. So they would be called passions or affectations or appetites, even moral sentiments. So what we think of as one solid category of our experience, actually just back in the 19th century, wasn't so. It was seen as a different thing. So each of these different categories was treated independently and differently. Uh, the reason why I'm saying this is because as you will see towards the end of this uh, webinar, I mean, hopefully you will see my point. That's what I'm planning for you. Um, is that we take a lot of things for granted and we take a lot of things as being real. Uh, whereas when we look at our own experience, that's not always the case. And when we look at the history of, of how humans conceptualize their, their psychological life, that's most certainly not the case. So not just emotions, but also the, the whole separation between thinking and feeling is also something that's a rather new product 
in the in the history of, of let's say philosophy and psychology so even things like today i think sociologically you can see that we're going through a lot of these kind of earth shattering changes that deal with gender for example which is another category that we just take for granted but it's actually neither that old nor that real as we imagine that it is and the same goes for emotions so until mid 19th century we didn't really talk about emotions as being the center of our psychological life or even as one thing uh, the person on the right on your right was a professor of, of moral philosophy somewhere in the uk his name was uh, thomas brown and he is kind of like the grandfather or like the inventor of emotions because he was among the first people who tried to integrate all these independent concepts to form what we think of as emotions today. And I'm giving you here in this second paragraph, his definition of emotions, because I think he was onto something really very interesting and very modern, even though it was published in 1820. So he says like this, perhaps if any definition of them emotions be possible, they may be defined to be vivid feelings arising immediately from the consideration of objects perceived or remembered or imagined or from other prior emotions. So it's either something that's given birth by our thoughts, so our considerations, the way in which we see things, or they arise from our prior feelings. But basically right here from the very start of of the study of emotions, we see that even though they appear to have something to do with the external world and you know objects, as he says, perceived, so what we see and what we feel, what we smell and so on, they're actually the product of how our mind deals with these objects. And this is something that you hear a lot, and there are a lot of memes that remind you not, you know, that your emotions are actually your reactions and interpretations and not what the world is like. But we tend to forget this and we react as if that is not the case. So I think it's it's really very important to remember that the very study of emotions began, at least the modern study of emotions began with this idea that emotions have to do with how we perceive things not necessarily how things actually are. If we go back in history, which I promise I will not do, you will find all kinds of approaches to emotions like Stoics and early Christians. They considered a lot of what they used to call passions as being enemies of the reason and something just to get rid of. And then over time, we kind of developed a healthier and less aggressive way to deal with our emotions. Um, so this is just a brief introduction. And let me now explain sort of what emotions are, how they arise and why we have them. As my annoying habit is, I will start from an artwork, but it will not take more than a couple of minutes. So this is a photograph of a performance from 2010 by Marina Abramovich, whom you may know. And if you know of her, you probably either love her or hate her because she tends to elicit very intense reactions in people. So this performance was called The Artist is Present. And it was a very simple performance. But this is, I, I actually admire her a lot as an artist. And I would not say that this is her best work by any stretch of imagination, but because it is so simple and so penetrating, it's just remarkable in its own special way. So the whole performance consisted of one thing alone, which is that she would sit on that chair where you see her in red and not say anything. So, as a participant, so I see that you're raising your hands. That is an reaction that she tends to elicit. So just ask your questions in the Q&A and I promise I will answer. And I also promise I will get to my point briefly. So her performance consisted of sitting there and just looking at whoever would sit across from her. So you were not allowed to touch her or interact with her in any way other than just sit there and look at her. And to me, this, is, this really illustrates the essence of how emotions arise. So you look at her and you will have a some kind of reaction because there's another human being in front of her. And your reaction will somehow be visible either with your gestures or your body position or your face. And she will react to this. And then you will react back to her reaction. And so a lot of emotions can be generated between two people sitting in silence, just kind of silently reflecting and reacting to each other. 
And this is precisely how every emotion that we have is created. There, something happens, and then this elicits a response in us. And then, then we react to this response externally, and then we get another response. So emotions always arise as a reaction to, to sort of interactions that we have with the external world. The reason why I think this particular piece of art is important is because it tells us that we don't have to have any, um, any kind of uh, verbal explanation. It doesn't have to be a thought. It doesn't have to be anything at all that is specific, universal, or recognizable. If you've seen anything about this performance or if you've seen any images of it, you know that there was like hundreds of thousands of people that participated in it. And I, I kind of regret I didn't, but there's nothing in this world that I would stand in line for for 12 hours. I would rather give up food nonetheless in our performance. But I, I kind of slightly regret not, not going uh, because people had tremendously intense reactions. So some would sit and they just feel nothing. And then others would sit there and stay for 15 minutes. And then both of them would end up crying. And that also illustrates how idiosyncratic and different and particular our emotional responses are. So they're very precise. We tend to think of them as being vague, but you had hundreds of thousands of people sitting across from Marina Abramovich, and each and every one of them had a different experience. And I think this is very, very important because when we look at our own emotional responses and deal with them, we very rarely think of them in these very particular terms. Like, why am I having this response to this particular event? And this is incredibly important, as you will see later on, because it allows us to actually use emotions in a very useful way. So if you just suffer when you feel intense emotions, that's not exactly useful. It doesn't benefit you in any way. But if you understand the con context in which they arise and the mechanism that generates them, what you basically have is a key to deciphering and using them for your own growth. So this is what we'll be focusing in the first part. And then the second part, we'll be focusing on how this woman survived so many intense feelings without exploding or rather how to deal with those intense emotions. Uh, so uh, emotions are best seen as transitive states. So they're carriers of information about our interactions with the external world, real or imagined, I should have added this, this there, and what effects these interactions have on our internal world. So emotions don't just speak about what we do externally or what happens to us, but also they inform us about the consequences of these events for our psychological life. Uh, just like thoughts, emotions are equally meaningful expressions of our psyche. They're neither irrational nor irrelevant. In fact, every time when you catch yourself calling your emotions irrational, I don't know, like just gently slap yourself on the wrist. Because once you label something as irrational, you're basically calling it crazy. And our, you know, our culture informs us that what's irrational and crazy doesn't really have any causes or consequences. So it's like this event that appears out of nowhere. And this is never the case because our emotions, just like our thoughts, evolved for a specific reason. Uh, they helped us survive somehow, which means that they offer useful information. We live in a culture that tends to privilege thoughts over emotions. And the only reason is, is because thoughts are expressed with words, whereas emotions have different symbols. So, right, so emotions will be felt um, with different body sensations like butterflies in your stomach, pressure, tension, stretching, whatever else. Whereas feelings, whereas, sorry, whereas thoughts would be communicated with words. And why is it that our culture privileges words over sensations? Because words are easily communicable. So when you find yourself um, just talking to someone, you can easily communicate what you think, or let's say with greater ease anyways. If you have a thought, you can tell them, well, I just had this thought. Because we all agree on what words mean. So it's a language that we all share. When you say, um, let's say you look at the painting on the right. This is 
Vanessa Bell's painting. She was Virginia Woolf's sister. So you look at this painting and you say, I dislike this painting. And then I ask you why, and you say, because the cone in the background from the garden is not painted well. Understood. You may agree or disagree with me, but um, I really have nothing against that. It's just it's the first thing that I saw. But you, will, you may disagree with me, but you will clearly and easily understand me. So words give us some sort of certainty. And also what, when we put something into words, then that thing becomes manageable. Because when we have a label for it, we know exactly what we can do with it. Our options suddenly become clear. I was actually typing a response to someone in the program this, this morning or yesterday. Um, so I had, I had two very long days, so it's all like a giant blur. Um, so yeah, anyway, I was typing this response and it occurred to me all of a sudden that even in horror movies, like when they when they do exorcisms, like the key thing that they do is to find out the name of the demon because once they don't know the name, then they can cast it out. So putting putting verbal labels on things is important even in horror movies. So this is the benefit of thoughts. They they we are more reassured because we know what to do with them. Whereas feelings, even when you communicate what you feel by describing it and conveying it with you know, whatever symbols you can do that, you're never quite sure what that means to you and what how the other person that you're communicating it to will understand. And we are relational beings. So everything that happens inside of us was once in relations with other people. Hence, even when it comes to structuring our own internal world, we tend to privilege thoughts. And even thoughts we will describe as irrational, but mostly we will respect them because they're verbal. But when you feel pressure in your chest, you're very tempted to say, well, nothing rational could have caused this, so this makes no sense. And every time you say that, you're actually giving up on trying to understand your responses. They are structured, they're just expressed with different sets of symbols. It's like they speak in a different language. So it's up to you to learn that language, but not to ignore it or discard it. Um, it's also a fact of most of our experience that we don't actually react to all emotions in the same way. Like you will feel happy, for example, but you're not always going to be overwhelmed by the intensity of your happiness. Sometimes you will feel anxious and it will come and go and you won't necessarily want to run away from it. You will just experience it. But then at other times it will come back and be incredibly strong the emotion will be incredibly strong and it will overwhelm you. So we can, it's not the case that we don't like all negative emotions or all emotions at all. It's usually a certain intensity of them or a specific quality that we don't like. And this in itself is quite informative because by learning about the emotions that we tend to want to avoid and run away from and emotions that we are perfectly fine with, we can learn a lot about ourselves. Uh, if you've been to any other webinars, you know the man on the right. So it's uh, George Kelly, it's a psychologist that's very dear to my heart. And so according to his idea, uh, his ideas, so sort of we are, we kind of structure our experience in these constructs. And these constructs are hierarchically organized, kind of like this pyramid here on the left. Um, what's on the periphery, like on the, in the lower levels, is less important. So we can change these parts of ourselves without causing any major disturbance. So when we receive information about something happening with those lower peripheral, peripheral parts, those emotions will be easier to understand and easier to deal with. They're not very likely to shake you up. They're not very likely to overwhelm you. You're not well, very likely to run away from them. But the more you climb upwards, the more intense they become. And the reason why this is the case is because at the very top of that pyramid are your values, your values and your social roles, who you are as a person, what you value as a person, how you make your decisions, what, you know, whether you're a mother, a parent, a CEO, whatever. So that's what's on the top of the pyramid. It's what really matters. It's what makes up, makes up your sense of self. 
And when emotions notify you that something is happening in those upper regions, this is where they become incredibly intense and where we want to run away from them. And it's not because there's anything particularly specific and special about these emotions. It's because they indicate that we have to change how we see ourselves. And we really don't like to do that. So sometimes it's much easier to run away and try not to look at that and distract yourself than to kind of do the heavy lifting of change. So the more intense the emotion is, the more important its message is. And instead of running away, a healthier thing to do would be to, of course, once the intensity goes away, to reflect on what needs changing and what needs adjusting. I know that this may sound vague, and there's a very specific reason why I'm speaking in such broad terms. It's because these things are not the same for everyone. They depend on the culture that we grew up in. They depend on the family that we grew up in. It depends on also on the choices that we make as people, how we shape ourselves consciously. So certain things that might be core issues to me might be entirely relevant for you and vice versa. For example, even the same, like, let, let me use something that I know is an important thing. And also I'm inspired by the image here our spiritual beliefs or religion, for example. There are people who will have a lot of religious or spiritual beliefs, but they will not be like the core of who they are and how they see themselves. So when they encounter something that goes against their beliefs, or even when they do something that goes against their beliefs, because their religion is not there on the very top of the pyramid, it doesn't upset them as much. On the other hand, you have people who are very... Um, sort of very deeply religious and who go to church and practice the values that their religion preaches, when, when they break one of those rules, it becomes very intense because it is at the top of the pyramid. And it's the same thing. It can just have a different place in, in different, you know, for different people. For some, it'll be higher. For some, it'll be lower. And for some people, it might as well be completely outside of their, let's say, field of experience. It might not at all be relevant. Although I did choose religion, so people tend to have some sort of relationship to it, good or bad, but, it's, but it is quite possible. So something that might be a value for me might really not figure into your system of constructs at all. And again, vice versa. So when, when emotions are particularly intense, they actually want to attract your attention. That's your psyche saying, this is terribly important. Pay close attention and understand what I'm telling you. But because culturally and also you know, in different ways, experientially, we tend to run away from our emotions and write them off as irrational, we don't actually learn. And when we don't learn from the emotions that we experience, that's basically like you're inviting them back. Because if you, let's say, did something that goes against your values and then you experienced guilt, and if you don't actually carefully look at that guilt and investigate what it means and what you did, or even question the value that you broke, because sometimes it's our values that need to change, not just or not our behaviors. If you don't investigate this relationship, and if you don't implement changes based on the signal that your psyche sent you, well, it will send another signal. And if you ignore it, it will send a stronger signal. And you, if you ignore that one, well, it will send another one because our psyche is really annoying and relentless. So in that sense, running away from our emotions really just makes them more intense in the long run. Uh, another reason why I'm speaking so vaguely is not just that different things will cause different emotions in different people, but it's also because our emotional responses are extremely individualistic and different. Uh, we sometimes use these words like threat or fear or anger, but what they are for each and every one of us is quite different. This is what makes them tough to work with. Very often people will tell me, well, I felt anxious, what does that mean? And then I can give them an instruction. I can guide them in a specific direction, but I, unless it's someone I've been working with for a long time, I might not actually be able, able to know because there is no prescription for what causes anxiety, right? I gave you four definitions here, all from George Kelly's theory. 
so that you can understand some of the mechanics and, and sort of guide your thinking. Don't take these things as recipes. Take the method. Don't take the specific examples. I mean, if the examples resonate, by all means, take the examples too. But don't think of these as rules, more as guidelines. So guilt can be understood as information that our actions are in opposition to our values. So, and also to our sense of self, to our identity. So if I see myself, um, let's say, as a kind person, but then I start yelling at someone for because they just annoyed me, I will feel guilty. Even if, if I'm right to be annoyed, I will still feel guilty because I broke an important rule, which is that I'm supposed to be a kind person. For example, as a therapist, one thing that's very important to me is that I'm able to hear different stories and stories of people that are very different than mine and stories that I may not necessarily agree with. In fact, I'd say that a large majority of my clients have values that are not the same as mine. So for me as a therapist, it's very important to be able to accept and work with different systems of values and not trying to impose my own values. I can compare, contrast, suggest, whatever, but I'm, I cannot interfere with people's values because I don't like them. I can do that because they don't work for a person, but I can tell people, look, you know, your beliefs are stupid because mine are so good. So if I would ever find myself in that position that I'm unable to accept someone else's beliefs and instead feel the need to kind of aggressively change them or argue with them or fight with them, I would feel guilty. I would feel probably anger, frustration, and guilt. And when all these three mix up together at one time, it can be incredibly overwhelming. And this is why it's important that we're very patient with ourselves and kind of dissect these and understand them individually. Because anger will tell me that I'm disagreeing with this person, that I'm expecting something from them and I'm not getting it, and it's terribly important. And guilt will tell me that I've broke a very important rule. So if I want to learn from my emotional response, I need to know how to decipher these and I need to know which one's more important. Guilt trumps practically everything else because guilt basically tells me I've betrayed my own principles. So I have to go back and then rethink this. I mean, this is my personal example. Yours can be quite different. Anxiety means that we don't have adequate constructs, as Kelly would say, or rather you can't make sense of a situation. And so it might happen to you that you feel anxious, but you're able to define the situation. And then you think, well, Vladimir's definition sucks and Kelly's definition sucks because I know exactly what the situation is. But if the anxiety is there, it means that you might be able to define it, but you can't make sense of it. Because to make sense of something means to know how to act in a constructive way. So you're missing some tools. In, in, in the sense of sort of coping with the situation. So for example, social anxiety, I'm now generalizing broadly, not just to give you an example. So social anxiety can mean, will I have topics in common with these people? So then it, anxiety invites you to define some topics you can talk about, something that you can just quickly take out and, and start talking about. So that could be one way to work with anxiety. I can give you a practical example from my own experience from actually this Saturday. Uh, so this Saturday, I was supposed to give this like eight hour workshop on Zoom, of course, um, it, because I teach constructivist theory and psychopathology very often. And so I was supposed to give this workshop on, on a specific, very technical aspect of Kelly's theory. And I planned this eight hour workshop to a T because I like to be very organized and especially when I teach future therapists, I think it's very important to be theoretically precise and to give them a lot to work with. So I don't try to make things accessible. I'm very technical and formal. So it was supposed to be eight hours. And here comes Saturday, 10 a.m. I log into Zoom and I receive a call from the school director telling me, oh, I just forgot to tell you something which is that um, this, this, this semester we decided that workshops won't be eight hours, they'll be five hours long. Um, so just kind of make it work. And he hung up and I thought, oh my God, like, what am I supposed to cut? And it's like, and it's five minutes before I'm supposed to start teaching. So 
how the hell am I supposed to do this? Like, what am I supposed to do? And then I became very anxious for precisely this reason, because I was supposed to cut almost half of what I was going to say. And I had like five minutes to figure it out. So my anxiety in that moment acutely told me that I need to come up with specific tools. If I got caught up with my anxiety, instead of translating it, I think I would have, it would have been a disastrous workshop. Instead, I thought to myself, okay, so what's the broad distinction that you can now make between what's important, what isn't important? So I just kind of cut something. And then when I started teaching, I told people, I will send you literature for some stuff. So just tell me what you're interested in knowing and what's difficult. And then let's address the issues that are difficult so that I can simplify it for you. And then the rest you can do on your own. And I kind of figured it out with them. But initially my response was anxiety because I had a very short period of time to do something that's quite big, especially because this is a workshop that I've been planning for some time. So a lot of reading and preparation went into this. And then instead of getting entangled with my anxiety, I thought, okay, so this anxiety means that I have a tough job ahead of me. And since I can't do it alone, because anxiety tells me I don't have the tools, I'm going to outsource some of this to other people. And since I had like 50 students there in front of me, I thought, well, they should have a say in this as well. So I just quickly created a poll and asked them to vote, kind of the way that I ask you to vote for topics. And they chose what their priorities are. Uh, so were, so I just kind of addressed those. And then with the remaining time, I added what I thought was important as well. So I used my anxiety to help me find the solution. And because anxiety told me, you yourself don't have it, then I decided to share responsibility with people who were actually supposed to listen to me. One of the reasons why I have the poll to, for people to vote for the topic of these webinars as well is also because I think you should have a say in what we talk about, because it's very difficult to come up with a topic every month. And also I will just end up talking about what I care about, which is not necessarily something that you care about. So that would be an example of how I can use anxiety to actually improve. Fear can be seen as information that a part of who you are, so not all of who you are, but a specific part of who you are may have to undergo some significant change because you're about to encounter an experience that is going to produce that change. When fear is terribly intense, we call it threat, and that means that all of who you are is now endangered. The danger, of course, not being physical, but psychological, and it tells us that we need to revise a lot about how we see ourselves. Hostility is a very interesting phenomenon. And it basically comes up when we realize that what we're trying to do isn't working. But instead of changing, we decide to go ahead and ignore reality and then kind of extort and twist the evidence that we are getting from the external world so that we can continue to think in the same way. This is something that you see in politics all the time. When you have you when you have people who can consistently ignore facts and they just kind of rework them because it's very important for them that the facts are actually upside down. So they do that, they try to falsify reality in order to maintain a certain self-image or a certain idea. And we always do this as human beings as well. This is a part of it's it's like a defense mechanism that we employ. So that's one way to see hostility. Sometimes it actually involves physical hostility. You just bully people into telling you what you want to hear. And then you can say, there you go, I was right all along, right? So these are just some examples. The method being that an emotion is actually telling you about a change that is occurring or is about to occur. That's the, the key point to remember from this. Let's just see how this ties into skin picking for those of you who might be here for the first time. So let's say you start thinking about an issue. You're watching TV or Netflix or whatever people watch these days. And then there comes a certain point where you've seen like six episodes of something in a row and you're no longer focused on that. Instead, you start ruminating. You start thinking about what you need to do tomorrow. So you say, like, um, I need to wake up uh, very early tomorrow, like 6.30. I need to, I don't know, do the laundry. I need to start working. I have so many clients and so on. And so as you start remembering your tasks, you start remembering more and more and more. 
And then naturally, as our brains have this annoying tendency, you start thinking about the day after and then just like your whole month and then where you are in your career. And suddenly from what I need to do tomorrow, you come to this overwhelming amount of thoughts. And then all these things that you need to do suddenly seem impossible. And then all kinds of body sensations start appearing. You can't sit still anymore. So you want to move around. You kind of, uh, you know, move your legs around or start fidgeting and squirming in your seat. And then suddenly it becomes very tight in your body. It becomes very intense. And then you can't take that intensity anymore. Sometimes this is not a conscious process. Sometimes it happens completely unconsciously. And then we just kind of catch ourselves doing it at a certain point. But mostly the intensity becomes too much. And then picking comes as a way to just drift away from this intensity. And then because you drift away, because you hide, you distract yourself from your own body and your own mind, your body also relaxes because your body is reacting to your thoughts. And then when you distract yourself from your thoughts by immersing yourself in picking, your body can relax. So it has a soothing effect. It's like Xanax of some sorts, except that you, know, you don't need a prescription for it. But then you become calm. And then what happens is that you see the damage you've done. And then suddenly you start judging yourself. And then you start the cycle all over again. Maybe not immediately, but in an hour, a day, or a week, depending, of course, on how intense your picking is. So skin picking is both initiated by difficult emotions, and it's also maintained by those difficult emotions. So you kind of get into this crazy cycle of just repeating things over and over again. And if you can, from, if you can see from here, the starting point of the cycle is our thoughts. So we start overthinking something, and then our body starts reacting. Even when we're thinking about something external, something that we're seeing, something that we're hearing, it's still our thoughts that try to make sense of the situation. And then our body reacts to these thoughts. And then also, of course, to make things more complicated, our thoughts react to our bodies as well. So learning what to do when body sensations appear and learning how to treat our thoughts would be the first two links in working with difficult emotions, because this is where they come from. Emotions are just your body reacting in very intense ways. So you need a method to understand that. And then since your thoughts are usually what triggers it or your attempts to make sense of, of your experience, however you wanna phrase it theoretically, then this is also a starting point. And this is where we will be, we will be intervening tonight. I will be telling you about four different ways to work with emotions. Again, we're talking about long, super long-term ways. If you want to learn about immediate ways of soothing or relaxing, then vote for the grounding and breathing exercises. And we can have the whole webinar just practicing them together. And I can teach you how to do them because they're rather simple. One way is to cultivate equanimity. This is a meditation practice, but if you're well, basically belong to any world religion that includes prayer, then equanimity is also something that probably can come from there as well. We will talk about diffusion and how to relate to our thoughts differently and to what we feel so that we don't enter into the spiral that I just described. We'll talk about the RAIN technique, and then we'll talk about this concept called self-indifference. It's a very interesting concept and it's basically an approach to life that we cultivate so that we can handle emotions better. I find it very intriguing and it doesn't involve actually not caring about yourself just to be clear. So let's start with equanimity. Uh, this definition is slightly kind of poetic but I will give you a more practical one. So this is from Sharon Salzberg's book called Loving Kindness, The Revolutionary Art of Happiness. Uh, this is an excellent book, and if you're interested in learning how to cultivate loving kindness, compassion, equanimity, or joy, this book will offer you very, very well-structured meditations and excellent examples. Just keep in mind that she's Buddhist, so her approach is it's not overtly religious, but she does use a lot of Buddhist terms. So her definition is the following. Equanimity is a spacious stillness of the mind a radiant calm that allows us to be present fully 
with all the different changing experiences that constitute our world and our lives. So equanimity is when a lot of things is, are happening to you, but your mind remains still. This kind of spaciousness of the mind, it's hard to explain what she's talking about, but if you've been meditating for a long time, or at least for a while, I'm sure that you know that moment where you kind of become non-reactive, and then you just observe things as they come and go, and you're fully present, but at the same time, it's almost like that there's this, it's, I, I, I lack words, I'm sorry, I just cannot describe it, but I, it's, it's a very peculiar feeling that once you feel, you will know exactly what it is. But the, the stillness of the mind is the, the key idea to remember from this definition. So this is Sharon Salzberg. She's also an incredible teacher and a very, very kind person. Um, one of those people that actually practice what they preach. I really admire that about her. Uh, because sometimes you see a lot of these like life coaches and these popular people who teach meditation and you see them in a state of complete, you know, throwing tantrums when, when people are not looking. And I don't really, I don't know, if you haven't, I don't know. It's like teaching someone to ride a bike without knowing to ride the bike yourself. But she really isn't one of those people. Anyway, um, I digress. Um, so equanimity allows us uh, to let go when we learn that we can't control something. And this is the case of our emotions. We, in the long run, we can cultivate certain emotional responses because the way that we have habits of behavior, we also have habits of the mind. So when we, we approach situations with a specific intention, ultimately we can have a desired emotional response. But once an emotion appears, we really have no control over it. You cannot make it go away. In fact, the more you try to make it go away, the more energy you give it. It's basically like you're feeding it and it becomes more powerful. So equanimity allows you to see what you can and cannot control. And it allows you to focus on what you can control and let go of what you cannot control. That in itself is a very calming thing. So right there, you already decrease the intensity of emotions. Um, stability of the mind that equanimity is allows you to kind of open up to difficult experiences. Because you're still, you can look clearly at what's happening. So you don't have to run away from emotions anymore. You're not reactive to them. You are proactive. That means that you will feel all of it, but because your mind will remain still, you will be able to act with your values in mind, not with the panic in mind. In relationships with other people, so equanimity is not something that just happens inside of us. If you remember, I said earlier that we are relational beings. So everything that's internal is in some way also relational. In relationships with other people, equanimity allows us to understand and accept that we're really not responsible for anyone's happiness but our own. That doesn't mean that we don't care about other people. It just means that we don't meddle unless they ask us to help. Uh, this also means that you can be kind and giving and empathetic and loving. But if someone doesn't accept your love and doesn't appreciate your kindness, you can direct it towards those that do, because there are always people that do. Sometimes in our attempts to be loving and nice, we smother people. I don't know if you've ever read um, The Unbearable Lightness of Being by Milan Kundera. If you haven't, I recommend it. It's a really beautiful book and it's very easy to read. I read that book like every now and then because the way that he writes, like every character in the book basically represents a specific position, philosophical, moral, this or that. And Unbearable Lightness of Being, among other things, deals with questions of intimate relationships and fidelity and attachment. And like, a, there's a lot of stuff going on there. And I've noticed over the years how my relationship to different characters changes. So I remember I first read it when I was starting high school, like I was very young. And there's this character called Teresa in the movie, which I do not recommend, Juliette Binoche plays her. And she is so deeply in love with, later on, her husband, Tomas. Um, like her love is just so pure and so intense and so profound. And I remember reading that as an adolescent thinking, my God, she loves him so deeply. And he cheats on her very, like very frequently in the book. And I used to have a lot of anger directed at him. But now from this more adult position, I'm thinking, 
uh, sure, she loves him, but she also smothers him. Like she literally just drowns him in love. She's Kathy Bates in misery, that kind of love. And that kind of love is suffocating. And equanimity allows us to kind of temper our responses to other people. It also allows us, so we never go into that extreme. It, it, it's really beneficial to regulate our interpersonal relationships because you see where you cannot help, so you don't try. That means you spare both yourself and the other person a lot of frustration. When they're ready, if they're ready, they can ask for help. And it's also very helpful because you, you get this clarity and this stability of the mind. You also know where your own boundaries are. And when I work with people who struggle with skin picking, this issue with boundaries always comes about in interpersonal relations, but also in personal boundaries. Um, people will decide that they have to be very successful at work, and then they will ignore when their body tells them, you know, hello, I need to sleep, or I need to rest, or I need to play, or I need whatever, food, water, because people will chase after their fantasy to that extent that they will cross so many boundaries that eventually their body will just start screaming. And when it starts screaming, then you start picking. And then you and your body just take your war on a whole other damaging level. And when we have this kind of clarity and stillness of the mind, we can see, okay, I can't do this. I need to draw a boundary right here. And this is sometimes very painful and very sad, but it's always very beneficial for ourselves. Because ultimately, even if we destroy our bodies to achieve our goals, we won't be able to enjoy the goals we've achieved. So it was a futile struggle all along. Equanimity really spares you a lot of that nonsensical running around. So it's not indifference. It's not that you don't care about other people or yourself. You care and you're being compassionate. You just understand what is it that you can and cannot do. Uh, this is, uh, sorry for interrupting, but one, one place where I see a lot of space for equanimity um, is especially in younger clients who are very engaged with issues of social justice of one sort or another. They always kind of feel like they're not doing enough or like when it comes to climate change, recycling, like they'll be vegetarian, then vegan, then they will try not to use plastic, then they will, I don't know, whatever else they'll do, like recycling, I guess, starts at the very beginning. And then after doing all this, they still somehow feel like they're not doing enough. And equanimity is actually very useful there because, because it tells you this is as much as you can do because you're one human. The change that needs to happen is is really beyond you. So you draw a boundary, but you don't necessarily give up on the goal. By having a clear boundary, you actually see the struggle better so you can engage in more creative ways. So it gives us courage and it allows us to face our pain over and over again, as much as it's necessary so that we can be vulnerable because we need to be vulnerable to grow and develop, but we're not overcome by it. So we're vulnerable, but we're not damaged. We actually use vulnerability to grow. Peter Harvey has this beautiful definition of equanimity, which is that it's the opposite of how James Bond likes his martini. It's stirred, but not shaken. And I think that's a really good way to sum up equanimity. We can cultivate this in meditation, but using different techniques. You can use visualization techniques. You can repeat certain phrases and then reflect on how they make you feel. Sometimes you can, especially if you have a spiritual practice of some sorts, sometimes just kind of just getting in touch with your spirituality in the moment when you're overwhelmed by intense emotions can be very helpful. I cannot tell you how many clients I've had over the years who would find prayer to be extremely calming. It sometimes it literally acts like a magic pill. And, and people find a way to implement that in their everyday life. And they use that as, as a kind of reminder of equanimity. What I like to do sometimes is, uh, so equanimity is a part of my meditation practice. It's not the center of it, but it is a part of it. But in everyday life, when, when I start realizing that I'm overwhelmed by what I feel, um, I switch immediately to that kind of constructivist way of thinking, which is, okay, so my body is sending me a message now. Let's see what I can do to help it. Or sometimes I will remind myself that this is, also an insight that I think you get when you meditate very easily, which is that 
no matter how intense it is, uh, it's not going to kill me. So I'll be fine. And for some reason, that really helps me. Like, even if I'm terribly intense or terribly tense, sorry, or just upset or angry, if I just think that this is just going to pass, it already calms me down. So you can find something that works for you and then just keep it as a reminder and to kind of pull out the equanimity out of you. Because this is a trait that we all have. It's developed to different degrees, but like any capacity, it's like going to the gym. Like you have to practice it all the time for it to become stronger and bigger. Another way to approach this that doesn't require you to do any meditating is to practice techniques of cognitive diffusion. So this is specifically from acceptance and commitment therapy. And it is something that we use in our program extensively. And there are really dozens and dozens and dozens of different ways to do this. I will give you some ideas and some examples. Uh, and But if you like, and if you need more, I can provide you with more. It's really not, not an issue. We can even have a whole webinar on diffusion if you like. So. Uh, we're often, when we say that we're fused with our experiences, that means that we take what we think and feel at face value. So instead of understanding our thoughts and emotions as being messengers, so as being metaphorical in nature, we see them as being just completely true, just accurate, real. Uh, fusion with negative self-talk will then obviously lead to very difficult emotions because you will believe the worst about yourself, right? And then consequently, picking will be a way to alleviate some of the intensity that these thoughts cause in you. Fusion can occur in many domains. And I, I don't want to go into this so that I don't take too much of your time, but some of these domains are rules, reasons, judgments, self-narratives. Essentially, the way that looks is that you will have an I am statement and then you know, add whatever negative thing you want. So you, you will maybe pick and then see yourself in the mirror or just see yourself in the mirror and see a, a pimple, a blemish or some or nothing, and then think I'm ugly. And immediately that triggers a very, very intense emotion. Or you will see the workload that you have and you'll think I just can't do this. And then you will take this at face value because what your mind is actually saying is, you have a lot of work to do, but because the thought that arises is you can't do this, you will take the thought and say, yeah, I can't do this. I'm really a loser. And then you just spiral down from there. Self-narratives refer to these little stories that we tell ourselves. This is not just a psychological technique. It's also something that we know from neuroscience that we have, which is that our brains tend to take different events in our lives and then create stories around them. Uh, as you can guess, we tend to create more stories around negative stuff than around positive stuff. Uh, and we're also more, more likely to believe those stories that we tell based on the negative things that happen to us. Like a very obvious example of this is when people experience some sort of traumatic event. That event is usually a once in a lifetime event, yet very often they experience a lot of difficulties because the narrative of their lives tends to be kind of woven around this one event. That also means that dozens, thousands, tens of thousands of positive things are left out of the narrative. So that immediately gives you a more filtered, reduced version of yourself. So when you believe these stories that you tell yourself about yourself, you're actually kind of closing in on yourself in a very strange way. Our, just remember, if there's one thing that you need to take from this slide specifically, is that our thoughts are always metaphorical. It's like poetry. Um, and our emotions are always messengers. And a messenger doesn't necessarily bring you highly useful information every time, right? Nor is the suggested reaction, like the first impulsive one, the actual cure. You need to look at the message, not at what comes as a natural response. So when we practice diffusion, we actually practice reversing this process. I have to, so this, I did say this is from acceptance and commitment therapy, but this is completely and fully constructivist in its approach. Uh, acceptance and commitment therapy and constructivism actually share some roots in, in pragmatism and also a lot of the CBT, including acceptance and commitment therapy, 
comes from constructivism because the early CBT therapists were very much influenced by George Kelly and he's he was a teacher of, of actually a good deal of them. So even though they don't reference him as nearly as they should, uh, I like to think of CBT as just being a special case of constructivism. So this is all fully compatible. So in constructivism, we see all our thoughts and feelings as constructs, right? Um, or at least as elements of constructs. Constructs are interpretations of reality, but they're not reality itself. Uh, even when we talk to other people, we often don't really communicate with the other person. We're communicating and reacting to our image of the other person, which, if you think about it, um, is quite sad that we are so in our heads to that extent that we just basically read into a lot of what people tell us. And especially, for example, if you've been struggling with skin picking and self-confidence for a long time, then you don't read into what people tell you, you sometimes read into the way they look at you. And then when someone looks at you while you speak, you think, oh my God, this person's looking at my skin. And because you are fused with your thoughts, you immediately assume that's true. And then you just go with it. And then you have a specific image of that person as a consequence. You see them as being, I don't know, rude or, or intentionally hurtful. And then you also feel hurt. And basically, the whole thing takes place in your head because you're reacting to an interpretation that creates an image of another person. And then you respond to the image of another person and feel bad. And then feeling bad reinforces that image and then just go on and on and on. So we're, we're really locked up in our heads very often. Uh, we kind of trap ourselves into a cage of our own making when we do this. Um, I don't know if you can see. So let me just move. Uh, sorry. So this little thing here in the background this is a cow so that was a present from a friend of mine and i always keep it close to me um it's a very very close friend like my best friend let's say uh and i remember he recommended a movie to me once or a tv show i don't remember what it was and so he told me he liked it and that i should probably watch it and i did and then I didn't particularly enjoy it because it wasn't, it's like this fantasy genre and it's not really my cup of tea. But then I thought like he's a really smart guy, like he's a mathematician. So he probably has some more profound point there that he saw. And so I started analyzing it. And then when, when we spoke at some other point, I gave him like all these thoughts that I had about his I, I think it was a TV show. So I told him like everything I thought about this and all the ideas that I saw there and what I thought was the actual point of the show and, you know, all this. And he was looking at me the whole time, just kind of slightly raising his eyebrows and looking up and then down. And, and then in the end, when I finished explaining how profound the show was, he just kind of leaned in like this and he said, Vlad, you're thinking too much again. What did I tell you about thinking too much? It's a ghost story. Just relax. Like it's supposed to be funny and it's supposed to scare you. There's really no profound philosophy there. Just don't think. And then I was, of course, outraged because my job literally is to think about stuff all day. Uh, I was like, what do you mean? But there are all these things. And he said, sure, there are all these things, but there also might not be all these things. It's just fun to watch. And then he told me, think about cows. Cows don't really think too much. They just chew grass, enjoy the sun, and they're really quite happy. And so I, I was a little, I have to say, annoyed because I spent quite a lot of time, you know, thinking through the, the whole thing that I didn't even enjoy in the first place. And then like a month later, he said, well, I was, I was walking past this yard sale and I saw this little cow and I thought he should have this as a reminder not to think too much. And then he gave me the cow. So I carry it around and I have it in my workspace always because it reminds like that cow in itself to me is like a token that reminds me of cognitive diffusion. It reminds me not to necessarily take my thoughts as seriously because not everything has to be as profound or not everything is you know, in need of serious analysis. And I look at that cow sometimes when I'm upset and the cow itself <laughs> diffuses my thoughts, believe it or not, because it reminds me of what's what's underlined here in red is that whatever my thoughts are, they are interpretations. They're really not necessarily facts. 
And there's also another thing that, that's worth mentioning, which is that if you notice how your brain works, you will see that you very rarely fuse yourself with positive thoughts. It's usually the negative stuff that you fuse yourself with. No one is fused with happiness and then just kind of enjoys in this storm of, of feel-good chemical substances and then spend their days like this. And no, most people are actually just fused with bad thoughts. And you know why? It's because our bad thoughts are what's aligned with our fears. And our fears are what we're trying to avoid. And then when we see a thought that indicates that a fear might be coming true, we immediately assume that this thought is evidence. And then we say, aha, there you go. That's just what it is. So sometimes someone can look at you and your fears can see that and say, there you go. It's exactly as I suspected. And the trouble with our fears is that they will find a way to confirm themselves somehow if we remain fused with them. So how do we actually go about diffusing our thoughts? So it's, I guess it's clear to you by now that diffusion is actually just a process of disentangling yourself from your thoughts. In Acceptance and Commitment, I was reading this book, um, it's called, the, um, well, I forgot what it's called, sorry, but it's, it's not a popular book, it's for therapists anyway. So in that book, they say that cognitive diffusion allows us to look at thoughts rather than from them. Because our thoughts and our emotions, they color the way we perceive everything else. So they, they not only are interpretations of the world, but they also create a kind of filter. It's like those Instagram filters that suddenly make everyone look beautiful or terribly ugly as it usually happens in our heads. So thoughts kind of form our point of view. When we diffuse them, we see them as well. And then we see how they affect the way that we react to things. So we extricate ourselves from them. So there are many ways to diffuse your thoughts. Like the simplest way that you can do that, it's really very simple, is just to pause for a second and say, I'm currently thinking this, and this is making me feel whatever way. It's like a very simple intervention, but if you pause and do it, you will see how once you say this thought that I'm having is making me, let's say, feel I don't know, like pressure on my chest, you will immediately see how these two slightly divorce from each other. So that's like a very simple thing. If, if thoughts are intense, it helps to say them out loud. Uh, there's a technique where you're supposed to say it out loud 20 times, slowly. And then there's another technique that says that you can take these annoying thoughts and then repeat them just over and over and over and over again, very, very loudly, very, very intensely. Because once you hear them out loud, you immediately get detached from them. One way that you can do is you can say, say them with a funny voice, which may sound silly, but actually does work very well. You can say them as a newscaster, which is what I like to, like to do you know, sometimes. Like in other news, Vladimir is now overthinking this yet again. And then when I do that, somehow it reminds me that I shouldn't. You can think of them as movie trailers and then give them genres, say, oh, here's a thriller coming, or, well, this is a boring drama or something like that. So you can find a way, I like to use humor, as you can see, because for me, humor is like a natural diffuser. Once I can laugh at myself for having, I don't know, a problem of some sorts, I know that I'm like already not taking it as seriously. And I'm really lucky enough to be surrounded with close friends who will tease me without mercy for everything. And I will tease them as well. Our sense of humor is really brutal. And when we sometimes joke like around other humans, they sometimes actually think we're insulting each other but because we are very close. Then it, we know it comes from a good place. And this also helps create a little bit of a distance because that's what diffusion is. Just slight distance, just taking a step back. So humor helps a lot there. But you can also just do what I said, just kind of repeat the thoughts or just say, I'm having this thought right now and it's making me feel a certain way. When it's just the feelings, so when you cannot identify the initial thought, when it's just the feelings that you're feeling, you can describe what you're feeling. Just start describing it as many specific concrete little details that, that you can. And if, if it's possible in any way, do it out loud. Because as you're forming a description of a feeling, what it does is that it helps you understand that you're describing sensations, that there's nothing 
essentially and inherently scary or terrible, that a feeling cannot kill you, basically. That guilt is maybe your stomach turning or falling. That anxiety is your just is just your heart working faster. And just it also works faster when you walk or run or lift weights. And then it goes away. So once you describe the sensations, you switch perspectives immediately. There's another way that you can do it, which is just to put your hand on your heart, but not over the shirt like I'm doing now, but just skin on skin, and then focus on that warmth. That tends to work very well. It's a more gentler way to diffuse. You can also do breathing exercises as well, but these are some of the methods that I prefer and that I like to use, both personally and also with other people. Um, now I will tell you a little bit about the RAIN technique, but I'm looking at the time, so I need to be very efficient. I always get so carried away. Now you know why I have eight hour workshops for, for future therapists. So uh, RAIN is a mindfulness based technique, but you don't actually have to meditate to apply it. So you just need to learn the steps. It was developed by Michelle McDonald, but it was really made famous by Tara Brack. She is like the queen of RAIN. She writes about it. She has a whole book about RAIN. Uh, she teaches it, so she's most of the resources that you'll find will be hers. She's an excellent teacher, even though I really do not appreciate, she uses a lot of new age language that sometimes annoys me, but she's an excellent teacher, just truly excellent. So RAIN is done in four steps. So these are the four steps that you're supposed to repeat every time an intense emotion appears. So recognize, accept, investigate, non-identify, hence RAIN obviously. The only step that requires some complexity in terms of how you go about doing it is step number three. Step number one is something that's done in an instant, and step number four is something that basically emerges naturally once you do step number three well. So let's start with the first one, R for recognize. This really just means exactly what it says here. It means to, to understand that now you're experiencing a very intense emotional event. Because usually we're, you can't say that you're not conscious of them, but you're not very intentional about them. Because as soon as intense emotions arise, our first instinct is to run away. And that means that we are aware, but we're not actually aware. Recognizing means being aware and then stopping. So not trying to avoid, just recognizing it. And you can do that by, by just saying, okay, now I need to stop. If you're with people, for example, and you feel something intense, something that is about to overwhelm you, you can even say that to them. So now I just need to take a step back. So that's the first step. Just so knowing that an intense experience is happening. The second step is to accept. This is not as passive as it might seem, but let's say it, the shortest version I can give you is that it, it's giving yourself permission to feel horrible. You might ask, why is it that you're giving yourself permission for something like this? Remember, once an emotion arises, you cannot dissolve it at your will. It's, it is you, a part of you, like it, or it comes from you, but your conscious mind really cannot do much about this. Our psyche simply doesn't care in that moment what our conscious mind is or what's socially appropriate or what we expect and so on. So accepting means giving yourself permission to feel like crap. That's essentially what this step is about. And one way to do that is to just come up with one sentence that will summarize your state. Um, let me give you an example. Um, so on Saturday, when I, when I was told five minutes before that I need to cut half of my training, when I started becoming anxious, the way that I, well, I said, I can't really tell you what I said because this is supposed to be uploaded to YouTube. But let's say I said, oh shoot, I'm now feeling horrible. That's what I, let's say that's what I said because that is acceptable. So for me, like summarizing it like that, I usually like to come up with a one-liner that contains at least an element of humor. Not because I want to run away from the intensity of the emotions, but as I said, humor already helps me slightly kind of move, move away from, from an emotion. So 
Acceptance, you can formulate one sentence. You can even say it out loud if that's possible because saying things out loud actually helps quite a lot because it adds another layer of distance between you and, and what you're feeling. So first you recognize, then in one sentence, you give yourself permission. So you can say, I feel like crap now, and that's fine. That's one way to go about doing this. Step number three is the one that it requires a little more analysis and working. So investigate means that you're supposed to pay attention to different aspects of what you're experiencing. So let's say, let's say, let's take guilt as an example, because guilt is quite intense. And at least for me, I don't feel guilt very often because, well, I just try not to do stupid things. But when I do, it's quite memorable and it's very difficult to forget. So for example, when I feel guilt, investigation would go something like this. Conventionally, we will divide our experience to thoughts and emotions because they speak a different language, so that's convenient. So I investigate both. What's easier for me is to investigate thoughts, but you can see for yourself what's, what's easier and then go with that. So for me, it's more difficult to investigate the actual body sensations. So first I will list the thoughts that are going through my mind. Um, trying to think of the last time when I felt guilty. Um, sorry, I'm trying. It's been a while since I felt that way. But let's say that you list some self-judging thoughts, like "I'm a horrible person," um, uh, "What have I done?" Um, "This is unforgivable." I don't know. Let I don't. Maybe let's say I've hurt someone, so I've hurt this person. Um, what kind of a horrible human being I am. And, you know, all these lovely judgmental thoughts. So just list them. There's no need to engage with them. There's no need to understand any deeper point in that moment. Later on, you can reflect. You can, you can even write them down if, if you're able to and if you're in a place where that's possible. Just list them. So my thoughts are this, 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 this. And then you direct your attention to your body. And then you see what's happening in your body. So for example, when I feel guilt, because for me, the, the, body, the bodily aspect of guilt is very memorable. It's easy to describe. So I feel this sinking feeling in my stomach. And then I feel like my entire body just kind of fell into the ground a little bit. And sometimes if the emotion is particularly intense, I will feel like slightly the room is not, not spinning, but just kind of moving. I literally feel dislocated. Oddly enough, when Kelly defines guilt, he says it's the awareness of dislodgement from how we see ourselves. And that's exactly what I experienced. I experienced like I just kind of sink away from my body. So the second part of investigation would be this, to describe precisely what is happening in your body. But when you're describing it, try to be as literal as possible. So I don't know, tingling in my pinky. Um, this sensation is moving from this to this, like very, very basic level descriptions. Sometimes it, that might be difficult to do. So just do your best and that's it. The more you do it, the better you get at it. This investigation helps you gather data so that later on when you calm down, you can reflect and learn about what's happening. But at the same time, in and of itself, it's a diffusion technique because you're naming, labeling, and disentangling yourself from what you're feeling. So investigation is this very active dissection of your experience, what you're thinking, what you're feeling in the most concrete terms possible. And then when you do that long enough, what will happen is this non-identify part. You kind of, you're still feeling it, but you're at the same time above it. That's that stillness of the mind, if you remember from equanimity, where you can just kind of look around. It's basically like I'm describing this room. So I know I'm in this room, so you don't see. There's a lot of pretty artwork here because I like to look at it, so I put it here. So I can see like several paintings here and one lithograph, and they're always there. And when I look at them, I will experience them. And there's a lamp here, and there's all kinds of stuff around me. And this, but none of it is like I can like some stuff or not like some other stuff, but it's kind of like a fact of my experience. And this is what you develop, this is what non-identify means. You're still experiencing all of that. You just don't feel like it's a part of you. 
It's something that's kind of coming and going through you. If you know that poem, The Guest House by Rumi, that's exactly the feeling of non-identification. So those would be the four steps of RAIN. I will send you a short guided practice just so that you can have the experience of, of walking yourself or rather me or someone else. I'll see what files, which file I'll send you. Like, so that you can, some the, so that a voice can walk you through the, the exercise. And you don't need to be an expert meditator. This is just about learning the steps and what to do in each step. RAIN deserves a lot more attention and we can maybe even have a whole webinar on how to use RAIN as a competing response, as stimulus control, because it's very flexible in that way. And now a little bit about self-indifference and then we'll go to your questions. So self-indifference is a concept that I uh, discovered and it, it was essentially invented by Melissa Dahl. She has this very lovely text called How to Survive a Cringe Attack. She says, self-indifference is the relief of realizing that you're simply not that big a deal. The best, if counterintuitive, way to truly feel better about yourself is to see yourself as you really are, meaning not that big of a deal. So as we start to, to kind of explore this, it might seem like what she's suggesting is not to care about yourself, but actually she frames it in a completely different way. She frames it as a facet of self-compassion. Uh, she says that, so Christine Neff is one of the more famous researchers of self-compassion. And both her and Melissa Dahl describe this as sort of kind of recognizing that your suffering is universal. So where Christine Neff says that it's something that we all share, Melissa Dahl says that our suffering is really not that special. And they're both true because those are two sides of the same coin that whatever suffering we're experiencing, we're really never alone in this. And again, I will refer to kind of spiritual beliefs and religions because I think this is one ethical common ground among most of them is that they will always emphasize this interconnectedness that we have. And even psychological theory does that. When I said that we are relational beings in constructivism, that's precisely what it means. It means that we're all connected in different ways and that our, that our suffering, no matter how intense it may be, is really just everyone the same as everyone else's suffering. We may have a different flavor of suffering because we have specific circumstances. And sometimes in public life, we will give priority to certain types of suffering over certain other types of suffering because of different reasons, you know, not to go into that. But essentially this experience of, of suffering is something that we all can understand and relate to. And when we understand this, it puts our suffering in a different kind of context. So here's what she says in another place in, in this book called The Power of Self-Indifference. You are important and you are worthy, worthy of love, just like we millennials were taught in school. But that's true only because everyone is important and everyone is worthy of love. You matter because everyone else matters. I really like this concept. And like once or twice a year, I make these three month long courses where we explore different like facets of self-compassion. They're usually mindfulness based as most things that I do. Um, and I did devote a lot of time to exploration of this idea of self-indifference and that our suffering is only important because everyone else's is. Because I think overall, when you apply this as, as an approach to life, as an approach to yourself, I think it's, it's tremendously helpful because it always helps us put what's happening into a specific context. It also decenters us. It's also a way of living, living diffusion, let's say, not just applying diffusion. And oh, okay, I don't know how I did this that it appears in white, but let's say I did it on purpose. So this is where we can stop for today. It's a quote by Emil Siran, this, um, a Romanian, French Romanian philosopher. He says, the deepest and most organic death is death in solitude, when even light becomes a principle of death. In such moments, you will be severed from life, from love, smiles, friends, and even from death. And you will ask yourself if there is anything besides the nothingness of the world and your own nothingness. I think this, exactly what he describes here, is the opposite of, of self-indifference as being a connection to other people's suffering. 
it may seem on the surface like self-indifference is inviting you to not appreciate your suffering, but what it actually does is invites you to connect to other people because this is where both the, the companionship, like understanding of your suffering is, but it's also where its solution is. And he, you can always count on, on this person right here to provide you with the most abysmally pessimistic quotes. He's like the king of pessimism. So with this adorable message, I will stop and then we will go to the, to the Q&A.